Good morning. Hey, see, see, I'm not here. Good morning. Amen. It's good to be with your brothers and sisters this morning, isn't it? Where else could you or would you be on a Sunday morning? Church, we're just going to have a couple of minutes. We're just going to, we're going to pray. All right, we're just going to prepare ourselves this morning. We're going to prepare our hearts. Lay aside any distraction, anything that would impede you from entering, entering in this room, and from, from experiencing His holy presence. Yes? Let's just bow our heads and our hearts and just, just begin to pray. Let it hear your voice this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, church, let's pray. Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you. Let's lift up his hands. Glory to you, Jesus. Glory to your holy name. Lord, it's good to be in the house of God. It's good to be in the temple, Lord. It's good, Lord, to come into your presence Lord, with thanksgiving and with praise in our hearts. It's good, Father, to draw near to you, knowing that you draw near to us as well. It's good, Lord, to approach the throne of grace. Father, with boldness with confidence this morning. Because of what you've achieved for us. It is good, Lord, to be here. It is good to praise God. It is good to worship God. It is good to lift up the name of Jesus. It is good to praise God. Hallelujah. It is good to exalt his holy name. Oh, hallelujah. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, help us this morning to lay aside every distraction, Lord. Help us, Lord. Lord, to lay aside anything, Father. Lord, that would stop us, Father God, from communing with, communing with you this morning, Lord, we pray. Oh, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we will look not to ourselves, to our performance, Lord, because we know we fall short. But we look to Calvary. We look to the cross. We look to the blood, to the efficacy of the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all our sin today, Lord. That qualifies us to stand in the holy presence of God. Hallelujah. Father, glorify your name. Hallelujah. Let's just stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. I'm just going to read you some scripture and then we're going to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. This is from John chapter 16. This is Jesus, the Son, teaching on the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot buy it better than now. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority. But whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. He will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father hath has are mine. Therefore I say that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Friends, the Holy Spirit is here this morning to glorify the Son. To glorify the Son. That's his desire this morning. That the Son be exalted. The Son be lifted up and worship and praise. And we, inhabited by the Holy Spirit, we are here to lift up the sun, to exalt Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's worship God.
those people that burn for you, Jesus, that shine in this world, amen? Yes. And we can sing it on a Sunday morning because we've been praying and fasting. And God said to me, Jude, don't you move on from Sunday. Well, what did God declare in our midst? Firstly, that God is what? A big God. We need to declare that our God is a big God. And we have an empty devil. Not a big devil and a big God, but a big God and a little bitty devil. Because if you have not got that, you will be distracted here, there, and everywhere. And I don't know about you, but my life has been full of distractions this week. Personally, in the workplace, distraction after distraction. And I had to go back, God said, declare to you, where's your focus? My focus is on a big God, amen? And we had a word spoken to us last week by Chris and Tress that said what? KCC, it's time to come up here. You can't just drop that and leave it for last Sunday. God spoke, we trust them as prophetic voices. The invitation to us, corporately as a body, an individual, to come up here, yes? Comes from Revelation. John, come up here that you may show you what will take place after this. And God said to me this week, and I'm giving it to you, don't allow yourself to become distracted in this season by other things. As we're planning for an encounter weekend, believe me, there will be distraction, every distraction from the enemy, to get your focus off, preparing for that, and onto him, rather than on the glory of God. Amen? Your eyes must be fixed. My eyes, your eyes, our eyes, the fellowship, must be fixed on Jesus. He alone is the reason for your breath. He is the reason for your life and my life. He is the focus, amen? Not just Sunday morning. Morning by morning, I choose to fix my gaze on the King of Kings. I fix my focus and I will not be distracted and my gaze distracted to other things. He is the reason. He is the agenda. Fix your gaze on Him, church. Let distraction cease in Jesus' name. And let's respond to His invitation. His invitation, where the Lord would say, come up here. What an invitation from the King of Glory. Come up here. You have been invited to encounter God in the heavenly realms and meet Him in the throne room. Because of Jesus, we have access. Hallelujah. And not just on a Sunday morning, but part of your daily walk. The invitation is for that to impact your daily walk. Come up here. My children, come up here. So hand all your distractions over to God. Deal with them. Tell them to go. Give them to God. And make sure your focus stay fixed on Him. Give Him your undivided attention. As we respond, as I respond, as a fellowship, we respond to that invitation. Don't move on. Give God the glory. A God who speaks, and when he speaks, we need to listen. And as we've heard, be obedient in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
that your name might be glorified and that others might benefit too, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Bless the Lord. Before, before the children go out this morning, I need some help. Because uh, Christmas is coming and Rob's getting fat. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of chocolate that's been consumed has increased tenfold. Shocking. Give me a sense of shocking. It is Advent, it is the first Sunday of Advent today. You believe it already? And uh, yeah, we need to light some candles, or, or a candle, apparently. Advent. Advent means coming or appearing. And we are reflecting, we are looking in hope today. Hope. Hope is the key word. Hope. We are remembering the hope that we have because the Son of God left the glory of heaven, took upon himself human flesh and came into this world for a specific purpose. And that purpose was to reconcile us to God. Praise God for that. I'm going to ask the children to come forward. Those who are going to help me today, probably somebody's going to help me. Are you all going to come up? Are you all going to come up? Oh, sorry. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, yes, the barrel is Oh, no. No one is on. Oh, no. Oh, no. We'll be on the morning. It's a message of hope in the midst of despair. If you read the 
previous chapter, in Isaiah chapter 10, you see that it talks about judgment, a difficult time that's been spoken of for the people of Israel, but there is hope. And that hope is Emmanuel. So I'm inviting you now just to listen. We're just going to listen to a song, a favourite song of mine. <coughs>
Praise God. Sorry about the sound there, it wasn't the clearest. But there was another one we were going to show, the same guy, Joshua Aaron, if you haven't seen him or heard him, you can find him on YouTube. But I want you to understand the significance of what's happening there. Because that's in the Tower of David, that's in the old city of Jerusalem, and those are Jews. Those are Messianic Jews that are crying out, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Wow. These are significant times we live in, right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that is the cry of their hearts, and it's the cry of our hearts too, and it ties in well with what I, what I want to speak about this morning. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. The title of today's message is Redeemed. Amen. Yes, we've got one person that's redeemed. <laughs> redeemed! Amen. Yes, well, it's not Ephesians 1 verse 7. We're going to actually start here, but we're going to look at the, the, the theme of redemption throughout the, the, the New Testament. Throughout the Old Testament, we'll be in all day. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. I'll just keep reading some context. Which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Amen? Amen. Father, we come to your word again this morning with open hearts, hungry, hungry Lord, to feed upon your word, your living word. Lord, we pray this morning that Lord you breathe that word into our hearts again. That you give us understanding, Father. Lord, not just you, to grow intellectually, Lord, but to leave this place again changed by the truths of your word. Lead us into all truth this morning, Holy Spirit, we ask. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Redemption. Redeemed. These are interesting words that can mean different things to different people in our day and age. Well, we're going we're gonna to look at what the Bible means when it talks about Redemption. And I want to tell you this morning, there are three aspects to our redemption that we find in the New Testament. Three aspects to our redemption. Number one, we learn that Christ paid the price for our redemption. Christ paid the price for our redemption. Did you say to me, Rob, I know that. Of course you did. Praise God. And don't ever allow it just to be something something else that you know. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You are in relationship yeah. with the Lord of heaven and earth today because he has redeemed you. Hallelujah. Because he paid the price 2,000 years ago on that cross, on the cross of Calvary. And you know when Paul is thinking about redemption, surely he thinks back to the redemption of the people of Israel. We've just heard a beautiful song about redemption. O come Emmanuel, and ra ransom captive Israel. And Israel were redeemed from slavery in Egypt. Let me watch the Ten Commandments, I'm sure you have. Now they've got a new one, haven't they? The Exodus, it's a little bit, there's a bit of, um, is it artistic license, if that's the right word? Yeah. Bit of twisting going on and stuff. But uh, for the sake of film. But okay, you get the idea. You, you see the mighty hand of God at work as he judges the gods of Egypt. And he has to release his people, the people of Israel, whom he chose. It was his choice. And so the people have, have difficulty with that until today. But we need to remind ourselves it was his choice. And the Bible says that after, after a certain time, there was a Pharaoh that came along that didn't know Joseph or didn't know about Joseph. And he began to persecute. He began to give these Israelites a hard time in the land of Egypt. At the beginning, it was a blessing, but it turned into a hard time. 
time, a time of difficulty. And the Bible says that the people were crying out to the Lord. And the Lord heard their cries. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham. And that should speak to us throughout all generations, friends. Because whatever the Lord Jesus is doing with his people Israel today, with the nation of Israel, he remembers the covenant that was made with Abraham all those thousands of years ago. The very fact that they will one day experience salvation is because God made a covenant with Abraham thousands of years ago. And the people were crying out and they find it difficult. And God remembered his covenant and he raised up a redeemer. He raised up one who would send to redeem his people and that one was Moses. Moses and Moses is a type of Christ. You'll see types and shadows all through the Old Testament. You'll see various aspects of the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ is typified in the Old Testament. Moses was a type of Christ the Redeemer. And so God sends his servant Moses. Obviously, he grows up in Egypt, he has to leave Egypt, he goes back into Egypt with a mandate from the Lord. And that mandate is to command the Pharaoh to let the people go. And we know this story, we've seen the film, and it's awesome, folks. It's awesome as God begins, begins to demonstrate that he is the one true only God in all the earth. Despite all of these false gods that were worshipped in Egypt continuously, and God demonstrates very clearly to Pharaoh and to the people of Egypt, and not just to them, when the people of Israel came into the promised land later on, we hear that they heard of the marvellous things that God had done for Israel, bringing them out of Egypt. God was showing the whole world, the ancient world, that He is the one true God. And He's a redeeming God, a God that brought His people out of slavery. And let's think about that night, the night of the Exodus. You can read about it in Exodus chapter 12. And we're told on the 10th day of the month of Nisan, these, these people were to take a little lamb, bless it. Diane's not here, so I'll leave right <laughs> And uh, they were to slaughter the lamb. They were to slaughter the lamb on the 14th day of Nisan, at twilight. And they were to take some of the blood and they were to take and put it on their doorposts and their lintels. And the promise was on that night when the angel of the Lord would pass over that he would see the blood and he would pass up. He would pass over. That the judgment would not afflict them in these homes as they were eating. They were participating in fellowship and eating together. Can you imagine the screams that rang out over the, the, the land of Egypt in that night as the firstborn of every home, every family that did not have the blood on the, on the doorposts and the lintels as they lost their firstborn, of the firstborn of the cattle, everything. There was, it was a terrible, it was a terrible night of judgment. Blood was spilled in order that these people could be set free from the slavery of Egypt. And God brought them out of Egypt. And it's an amazing story. He brings them into the desert. And He makes them a people at Mount Sinai. He changes them from being the slaves that they were. And says, now He enters into covenant with them at Mount Sinai. Now you are my people. They were always His people. Of course, they didn't know it. As they were in slavery. They, they came out and suddenly they, they're meeting with this God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God they'd only heard about. And the wonders they'd heard about in the past. So that's the background to what Paul is saying here when he uses the word redemption. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And friends, everything that happened on that night and during those days with the people of Israel was looking forward, it was pointing forward to a greater redemption that would take place. The Bible says we've all, we're all slaves of sin as human beings. We've 
subjected ourselves to the slavery of sin and death. That every one of us, we need to be redeemed. We need to know what it is to have redemption. What is it to be, to be enslaved to sin? It's the bondage of the mind, the will, the body. Romans 6 verse 20, Paul says, inspired by the Holy Spirit. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. When you were slaves of sin, to be outside of Christ is to be a slave of sin. We need to understand that this morning. And we've seen that the way that they need to be set free is through forgiveness. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. The key that unlocks the prison door of sin, the slavery of sin, is forgiveness. And forgiveness brings freedom. Amen. Forgiveness brings freedom. Praise God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Hallelujah. The cross of Calvary, that was Christ accomplished for us on that cross 2,000 years ago. I want you to think about it. Think about the gruesome details. The things that he went through. He did it so that we might be ransomed. To, to buy us back from the slavery of sin. He cost him everything. There is one God. There is one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. There is no other way to be set free from the slavery of sin. There is no other way to be reconciled to God. There is one God and the mediator that he sent into the world. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. At Calvary's cross, Christ became your substitute. My substitute. I was a slave and so were you. We were slaves. We were helpless. We were helpless. We were hopeless in that particular situation. But God, hallelujah, but God has sent his Redeemer into the world. The same way that he sent Moses to those people of Israel in afflict affliction and in, in desperation all those thousands of years ago. So he sent Christ Jesus into this world to pay the price for you and for me. There's one God. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. It talks about sacrifice, friends. We've got to remind ourselves constantly of, of the cost, of the price. You see, God is holy, and God is righteous, and God is just, and God was under no obligation whatsoever to free us from sin. He could have quite easily allowed us to continue in this, enter into judgment with us, and condemn, condemn us justly and righteously to an eternity separated from Him. Because we chose, remember what I said recently in our Bible study, there are no innocent victims of sin. We are the perpetrators of sin. We are the perpetrators. We have sinned against Him. All sin, friends, first and foremost, is rebellion against Him. It's against him. And the wages of sin is death. And we're not just talking about physical death. We're talking about eternal separation from the very source of life, from God himself. Well, praise God, because the Bible tells us that the free gift of God is eternal life in yes. Christ Jesus. We didn't know it. I didn't know it. I was living my life just doing what everybody else does and then suddenly, praise God, God breaks in and reveals to us the real situation. Actually, you're a slave to sin. And this sin is a road to destruction and death and eternal separation. And thank God in His grace. And He says that, doesn't He? He says, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Right, it's purely by His grace. It's purely His mercy that moved Him to do something about our situation. Praise God. 
He paid that price 2,000 years ago on that cross. Beaten, wounded, rejected by his own. My goodness me. Despised. Hanging on that cross, hanging on that tree for all to see. Ashamed, embarrassed. You think about that, friends. Think about what he went through. Think about the graphically in detail. It's good to think about these things because it reminds you how serious sin is. Because sometimes we can forget. Sometimes we're quick to just justify things and just, you know, oh, look, this, oh, man, it's nothing serious. That's how serious it is. It, it cost him his life on that cross of Calvary. His blood, his life, blood was poured out at the cross of Calvary. He paid the price. He paid the price. There are those who have said that actually what he was paying, Satan. The price was paid to Satan. I do not believe that for one moment, friends. What was happening on the cross of Calvary was that the wrath of God, the justice of God, was being satisfied. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, as Christ hung on that cross, we, we only think about the physical, don't we? We think about the physical level of suffering. There was stuff going on spiritually that we, we can't even begin to comprehend. We can't even begin to get our, wrap our heads around. As he cried out, you know, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, I want you to think about that for a moment. Think about those words, I mean, wow, what do they mean? As Christ became a sin sacrifice for us, the holy, perfect, without blemish, the Son of God hanging on that cross. Taking upon himself all of our guilt and paying the price. It was to satisfy the justice, the righteousness of God. And not only that, to satisfy his justice and his righteousness. Do you understand that? Yeah. Praise God. It wasn't to pay Satan or demons or anybody else. You know, God, Judy said it this morning so clearly. God is the creator. Satan is a created yeah. being. He wasn't created as Satan, but he became Satan. For iniquity was found in his heart. We need to remember that. Friends, that's looking back. That's the past aspect. But there's a present aspect. There's a present aspect of our redemption. Brings us to our second scripture this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 20. The Bible says, You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You were bought at a price. We just talked about the price, the very precious life blood of the Son of God, the Messiah, poured out at Calvary's altar. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Mm. Hallelujah. There are powerful implications for the price that Christ paid on the cross. The fact is that now you belong to God. Your body, your spirit are His. They belong to Him. You belong to Him. And that's the first thing we see. Sorry, the present aspect is that Christ has freed us from a life of slavery. Christ has freed us from a life of slavery. We do not need to live as slaves of sin anymore, friends. 1 Peter 1 verse 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He has paid the price. He has bought you. He has ransomed you. You do not belong to Satan any longer. You do not belong to the slavery of sin. You are not a slave to sin and death and the curse and all these things any longer. You belong to God. You belong to God. What does this imply? The warning implies the freedom to belong. Freedom to belong. Amen. What does he say in Colossians 1 verse 13? He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us 
into the kingdom of the Son of His life, of His love. The Son of His love. You see, when you were a slave to sin, just like the people of Israel were slaves to sin, they were under the authority. They were under the, the, the slavery of, of, of the Pharaoh, who, who was a type of Satan. You understand that, friends? And in many ways, they belonged to him. And he treated them exactly how he wanted them to, how he wanted to treat them. And it was terrible. And it was hard going. And they were crying out. And they needed that redemption. And God raised up that redeemer. And then he brought them out to be his people. To enter into covenant with them. He rolled away the reproach of Egypt, friends. He set them free from Egypt and all its power. And he set those enemies of God and God's people. They drowned, the Bible says, in the Red Sea. It's an awesome story. An awesome story. So that these people might live a new life. So that they might live a life in covenant with the God of Israel. In covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac. And Jacob. And in the same way, he has delivered us from the power of darkness, from the kingdom of darkness. And conveyed us, he's translated us into the kingdom of his love, of the son of his love. As slaves, we were excluded from the rights and the privileges of the free. Yet now we have been redeemed in Christ. We have inherited the rights of sonship. Hallelujah. From the pauper to the palace. Oh, oh my goodness. Isn't it awesome? Yeah. Friends, I'm not just talking about people thousands of years ago. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about your condition before the Lord today. This is the truth that speaks about you. And you may say, well, I don't feel that way. But we shouldn't allow our emotions to define our identity, friends. We need to allow our identity to define our emotions. So we need to change and we need to remind ourselves of these things over and over again. And as we've heard this morning, to focus on the right things. Because it's easy to get distracted. It's easy. And let me tell you something. You have someone who is hopping your tail and trying to distract you. And trying to keep you from this truth. And trying to convince you that it is not true. It might be truth about someone else. But not you. That you don't feel that way. You don't think that way. So it can't be referring to you, but it is referring to you. If you're in Christ, you're in Christ by faith, this is referring to you. Hallelujah. But we need to be careful. And you've only got to read the story of the people of Israel as they go through the desert. These people who God has redeemed, who God has, has done mighty and wonderful things through His power. They've seen also, I would love to have seen those things, would you? And yet we see, within days, they begin to open the door to the enemy. They begin to allow themselves to complain and murmur and moan and question God's motives and question God's faithfulness and so on. The same people that had seen the Red Sea close, open for them, close over the armies of Egypt. And because the circumstances are difficult, because it's a hard place to be, they start to complain and cry out and, and blame Moses and Aaron and so on. We need to be careful. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 27, do not give the devil a foothold. Amen. Do not give the devil a foothold. Yeah. And let me just say to you, friends, oh my goodness. You know, we, we can encounter books. We can encounter conferences. We can encounter... Uh, uh, not, I was going to say tapes, but it's not tapes today. <laughs> CDs. CDs. Not CDs anymore. We're moving on from there. You can buy all the sets and everything, and they'll tell you. They'll give you the, you know, the strategies for spiritual warfare. The strategies. We need to discover the strategies for spiritual warfare, we're told. And we need to find the nearest high point. And we need to go up onto the nearest high point. And we need to pray until we pull down the principalities and the powers and so on and so forth. That's what we're told. The trouble is, we don't see that anywhere, not once, anywhere in the New Testament. Nowhere do you see the Apostle Paul standing on the Acropolis, praying over Corinth first to pull down with the disciples, to pull down principalities and powers, before he goes into a town and begins to proclaim the gospel. It is when you're active, you go about the Lord's work, and you're active in these places. Of course, there's a place for prayer. But nowhere are we told to do this thing. 
These things are being dreamt up by imagination, people with, with good imagination today, and they sell books, and they sell their CDs, and they sell everything else, and we get hungry, and we start buying them. But we don't look, we don't, we don't, confer, we don't confirm it with scripture. We've got to be so careful. We need to be careful, friends. You won't, I remember T.L. Osborne, that's not me actually, T.L. Osborne, many, many years ago, 20 odd years ago, we were there, right? in Falkston. And he warned us. And this is a man who's seen great things. This is a man who's been used by God in many countries. I know he's gone on to be with the Lord now. And he warned us about these things. He warned us about all these books and everything else that's going to give you strategies for spiritual warfare and everything else. He said, you need to actually just go about the Father's business and you'll get more from Go and preach the gospel. Go and start praying for people. Live for Jesus and you'll get the warfare. Amen. Live for Jesus. And you'll get the warfare. And you see that in the book of Acts. Because you see the Apostle Paul just obeying, just going into the towns, proclaiming the gospel, you know, praying to the sick and so on and so forth. Where does the, where does the warfare kick in? He gets thrown into prison. He gets beaten. He gets stoned. But he keeps getting up. And he cracks up. And he goes on. And, and, and that, friends, is spiritual warfare. That's spiritual warfare. Do not give the devil a foothold. You know, it's common to hear today people who, I, I know people who are bound, bound with offences, bound with bitterness and unforgiveness and talking about kicking the devil's backside. Do not give the devil a foothold. No foothold is not. It's like you want to, shoot, you want to close the door and the devil puts his foot. I'm not allowed to foot on it. Because you know what happened? The force is way out. You want to get serious about spiritual warfare, it starts here. It starts when we start to get serious about holiness. When we start to get serious about submitting ourselves to God and resisting the devil so that he will flee from us. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. That's what the Bible says. Get serious. We need to get serious about submitting ourselves to God. And then we resist the devil and he will flee from us. Praise God. How many hours have we got left? <laughs> Thank you. It's the freedom to belong. You do not belong to him. But let me tell you, he's going to come after you. And you haven't got to fear for. We haven't got to be fearful. Because, you know, when we're doing things, we're doing it from the, from the victor's side. It's his victory. It's his victory. But we've got to be so careful because he's so, so, so astute. Oh, he is. We have the freedom to be. He says, glorify God in your body. And in your spirit, which are God's. We are empowered to live the Christian life Amen. now. Right. Now. Okay? The Holy Spirit will enable you to live this life, the life that He requires from us now. Redemption is not just looking back at what Jesus did 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. Redemption is experienced daily. Amen. Right. We can live in the truth of redemption on a daily basis. As we're living out our freedom, freedom from sin and the slavery of sin. Notice the scriptures teach us that Jesus did not, the Lord did not eradicate sin from our lives. It's still there, but it needs to be suppressed. It needs to be crucified. Yes, we need to live above and beyond it. And the only way we can do that is living, submitted to God. Living enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 6 verse 12 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Listen again. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That's his instruction to us. Don't allow sin to reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in its lusts. We know it's there. We know the sin there. We feel the lusts. But he said that the Lord, the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul said, Don't let the sin reign in your mortal body. Resist it. Don't give in to its lusts. It's going to try and pull you away. It's going to try and entice you. Because that's how it works. You know that. It starts on the inside. 
But when we get serious about God and we start to submit ourselves to God, that's a threat to the enemy. When we're serious about holiness, when we're serious about living in impurity and holiness and righteousness, that's a threat to the enemy. No walking around telling everybody how you're going to kick his backside. We are free to serve God. Romans 6 verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Isn't that wonderful? You see, we weren't free from the slavery of sin so that we can live to please ourselves and just do our own thing anymore. We became slaves of God. Bond slaves, willing slaves. Lord, it's a blessing to be your slave. It's a blessing to be your servant. I willfully serve you, Lord. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. You see, either we are slaves of God or we're slaves of sin. And if we're slaves of sin, we're slaves of Satan. But we've been redeemed. We've been set free. Praise God. He's paid the price. Of course, we have to appropriate that in our lives, don't we? Finally, Christ will one day redeem our bodies. This is the future aspect. The future aspect. Okay. Romans 8 verse 23 the text we also who have the first fruits of the spirit anybody have the first fruits of the spirit today you should all be raising your hands you've got the first fruits of the spirit it is the guarantee of the inheritance that come friends it's the down payment that is put on the inside of you the guarantee of the inheritance to come we also who have the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves Groan within ourselves. Anybody groaning within themselves? Usually we're groaning within because we've got knees are aching or whatever. They have. But look what Paul says. We groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting. Anybody eagerly waiting? Yeah. Eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The redemption of our body. And here we are at the very heart of the Christian message, right, folks. Because as much as we like to speak about the cross of Calvary, as much as, as important as that is, without the resurrection it means nothing. <coughs> the Bible tells us very clearly in the four Gospels, accurately and clearly, that on the third day Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And he became, he became the premise, the first fruits, yeah. the, premise, yeah. the first fruits yeah. of the harvest to come. That's you and me, friends. Paul argues this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You can read it as your whole word. But what I'm trying to say to you is that, that, you know, the fact that Christ has been raised from the dead is the guarantee that you and I will also be raised from the dead. The resurrection. That's the message. That's the hope. That is the hope. Death is not the end. Death is not the end. It's just a stepping over, friends. We step over maybe into an intermediate state for a time where we're going to be with the Lord. But the ultimate goal is to be resurrected, to rise from the dead. The same spirit that was in Jesus Christ and rose him from the dead is in you. And he'll give life to your walking bodies. And when he's speaking about that, speaking about the day of resurrection, he'll give life to your mortal body. How wonderful. Bless the Lord. Although we can certainly know the power of Christ's redemption now, the power of redemption will one day include the physical body. Notice we're not redeemed from our bodies. We've got to get this right. There are some groups within Christian history who have said, you know, they're not worried about the bodies. The body's something evil. The body's something bad. And we need to be free from it. That's not Christianity, friends. That's, that's, that's Greek philosophy. And there are groups that believe that. There are groups today that believe it. They do not believe in a physical resurrection. Resurrection is physical. That's what it means. To be raised to life. This mortal body needs to put on immortality. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. This, this corruptible needs to put on incorruptibility. Did I get that right? 
Praise the Lord. Incorruptibility. Yes. The resurrected body will be free from sin itself. But not just sin, all of the consequences of sin. You see, right now in this life, we're struggling with sin, aren't we? We need to live and not allow sin to reign in our mortal bodies. But the resurrected body will be completely free from the presence of sin. There will be no more sinful lusts that are pulling you away. There will be no, no more of that. And because of there will be no more presence of sin, there will be no more presence of the consequences of sin. Sickness and death and all these things will be eradicated. Oh, yeah. 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 It's good to know, right? The body will then be imperishable, immortal, glorious, powerful and spiritual. But it will still be a body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you can read about that, yes. And so the Spirit of God says to us now, Ephesians 4 verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What is that day of redemption, friends? The day when Christ comes and raises us from the dead. Yes. Don't grieve the Spirit of God, with whom you've been sealed for the day of redemption. And so what do we see this morning? <coughs> Looking back 2,000 years, we've seen that Christ's death paid the penalty for our sin. Secondly, we've learned that Christ has ransomed us, has freed us from the slavery of sin. We don't need to live as slaves of sin today. And finally, Christ will redeem our earthly bodies when he returns. Friends, that's good news. That's good news. That's the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the good news of Jesus. That's what he's done for you and for me. Hallelujah. Let's just bow our heads and our hearts in his praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we glorify your holy name. Just begin to glorify him. Hallelujah. Is seated here this morning because of his grace. It's all according to the riches of his grace, the apostle Paul says. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let this become a reality for you. Maybe you need to correct your thinking this morning about who you are and who you belong to. Allow the truth to shape your understanding. Do not base your understanding, your identity on how you feel. The heart is deceitful above all things, the word of God tells us. Hallelujah. Father, <coughs> Father, we give you thanks for that. We thank you for these beautiful truths, the truths of your word. By your Holy Spirit, you remind us of today. Help us, Lord, to hold on to them, to grasp them. That these words will bring life, Lord, within each one of us. Lord, it is awesome. And things that are difficult for us to imagine. But Lord, help us to trust. Lord, you've given us the first fruits of the Spirit. Lord, we've been adopted into your family. We've become sons, Lord, from slaves to sons. And co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Lord, what mercy and grace you've poured out in our lives. Oh God, would it cost you everything? Our vision is to be a worshipping community at the heart of Kings Winford. Where every home is an expression of the kingdom. And every believer a disciple of the King. Our mission is to be obedient to the Great Commission. Through the faithful proclamation of the Gospel. 
developing, equipping and sending of disciples. Welcome to King's Wingford Christian Centre. 